Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Respiratory Protection in the Workplace, an Overview, presented by Beverly Nichols and Matthew DeAngelis. A few housekeeping items first. You'll be muted during this presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online chat or Q&A. We will be pausing at the end of the presentation and saving a few minutes towards the end for everyone to ask their questions. This webinar is also being streamed to Facebook Live and will be available on YouTube following the presentation. A link will be provided to you via email. At this time, I'm pleased to welcome our presenters, Beverly Nichols, RN and PhD, and Matthew DeAngelis, RN, MSN, and NP. Beverly Nichols is an occupational health nurse practitioner and has over 30 years practicing in the occupational health field with experience working in a variety of settings, including pharmaceutical, chemical, and biotech device industries, as well as academic and healthcare organizations. Beverly has overseen international health surveillance programs, corporate health promotion programs, and is currently involved with an interdisciplinary team, including safety and infection control professionals, in developing and implementing health and safety programs, including for respiratory protection, for a Bay Area Medical Center. Matt DeAngelis joined the Stanford University Occupational Health Center as a nurse practitioner in November 2011 after graduating from the Occupational and Environmental Health Adult Nurse Practitioner Program at UCSF. This came after five years of working as a charge and trauma nurse in the Stanford Emergency Department and several years as a nurse with the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. Prior to his nursing career, Matt worked in a research lab at the University of Chicago studying animal behavioral genetics. Thank you both so much for joining us. We're looking forward to your presentation. Good morning. I am Beverly Knuckles, and I wanted to uh, say both Matt and I are occupational health nurse practitioners, and um, as Michelle said, we're working in employee health occupational medicine clinics currently. I am a medical center, and Matt at a Department of Energy organization. Both Matt and I um, are not involved, um, uh, have any activity or relevant uh, financial relationship with commercial um, interests. Um, so, uh, just wanted to disclose that from the beginning. So, the objectives for this webinar are that at the completion of the webinar, you will be able to describe the general components of Cal OSHA Respiratory Protection Standard, uh, determine if respirators are required in your workplace, and if they are, um, how are they to be used, and um, how are they to be selected? Also, the process for medical clearance that's needed prior to fit testing and respirator use will be um, described as, and we'll discuss the purpose of fit testing and common sort of fit testing issues that come up in the real world. And lastly, we'll, you'll be able to understand how respirators can be used on a voluntary basis, both at work and with general um, public health concerns. So the Cal OSHA Respiratory Protection Standard is our state OSHA plan uh, standard for respiratory protection. There is also a federal respiratory protection standard, but there are 27 states or jurisdictions that have a state OSHA plan, and California is one of those. So. Um, the state plan can have additional um, mandates beyond the federal standards, but must meet at least the federal standard requirements. So the Department of Industrial Relations has a California Code of Regulations, or CCR, and Title VIII, Section 5144 is where the Cal OSHA Respiratory Protection Standard can be found. All organizations must follow this respiratory protection standard if they have employees who are required to wear a respirator to perform parts of their job. So important, the standard requires a written program that has eight uh, program elements that are defined and a trained program administrator. 
Now, I personally have seen a lot of programs being had by industrial hygienists or safety uh, professionals in organizations, but it can be run as well by occupational health nurses or physicians. And in a medical center setting, sometimes in very rural areas, you may see infection control nurse or preventionist um, fill that role as well. Um, and you also see sometimes in medical center settings, the environment of care has a team of uh, occupational specialists that might come together to work on the program um, together to administrate it. So the most important um, kind of role of this administrator, not only making sure it's an effective program, but also initially to review the program requirements with both the managers and the workers. So the required program elements that are outlined in the standard include making sure there's procedures for selecting appropriate respirators that are going to protect uh, individuals in the workplace, uh, making sure there's medical evaluations for employees that are um, required to use respirators, making sure they're um, fit tested for tight fitting respirators, make sure they have a good seal, um, that they are procedures for proper um, use of respirators, both routine and emergency use, and also for maintaining the respirators and for ensuring the functioning and the quality of the air supplied with the atmosphere supplying respirators. As well, um, it includes requirements for annual employee training and procedures for regularly uh, evaluating the effectiveness of the program. And we will go over all of these. So in looking at selecting a respirator, um, first and foremost, before selecting one, you need to understand if, in fact, the workplace exposures um, mandate a use of a respirator. Uh, so looking at the job task evaluation and the jobs and the job processes and doing a walkthrough hazard assessment is key. Uh, looking at the inventory of chemicals and other airborne contaminants that are used um, um, that may be in the workplace um, as well as used in certain work processes is important. And you can rely on safety data sheets. If you're unfamiliar with what those are, um, there's more on that in the OSHA hazard communication standards. Also looking at inventory of potential biological hazards is important in looking at this hazard assessment and if there needs to be protection from uh, aerosol transmittable diseases or pathogens. Also looking at immediately dangerous to life or health uh, situations, if there is any risk for an area to be of insufficient oxygen level, less than 19.5%, or if, in fact, there could be a spill or a um, exposure to a high level of a chemical that would be immediately dangerous to the health uh, of the worker, life-threatening, or if there's a need for um, fire rescue, if there's a fire then there are different kinds of respirators that would be needed in that IDLH scenario. There's also another one to look at just in general, if there's work-related respiratory illnesses that are known um, in the workplace, such as ones you may be aware of in terms of asbestosis, silicosis, uh, bisinosis, all um, looking at different kinds of particulates in the air, such as asbestos or crystalline um, silica or cotton dust. Next, it would be important to not only know about a hazard, but to look at the monitoring and specifically to look at the air monitoring and personal sampling that can be done by industrial hygienists. The American Industrial Hygiene Association, or AIHA, as well as the OSHA um, Consultation Service, um, or the Worker Comp, sometimes insurance company, may have lists of industrial hygiene consultants if you don't have a consultant within your organization. So industrial hygienists ha know all of the um, very specific and detailed ways in which to monitor chemical hazards to really understand 
what the levels are in the environment, including the time weighted um, averages that are over an eight hour shift, and look at how those compare to what OSHA has listed as permissible exposure limits for that chemical. These are regulatory limits that can be enforced through OSHA that says what amount or concentration of a substance can be allowed in a worker's um, respirable air. So in defining um, the chemical contaminants, um, that can be done through this OSHA table, table AC1 in the Cal OSHA standard, standard. but in general, is, there isn't such a table for um, levels of biological agents. So this means that you, for these workers that exceed the PEL, there needs to be supplied an appropriate respirator to bring their level of exposure below the PEL. There is a, such a thing as other occupational exposure limits, or OELs, uh, but these must be equal to or more stringent than the OSHA PEL. Some of these include state OSHA plan levels, uh, or PELs, um, NIOSH has some recommended exposure limits, or REL's, and the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, or ACGIH, has some voluntary threshold limit values that they have in a booklet that you can acquire from them. And sometimes I have been with companies that have developed their own more stringent uh, levels um, internally so that um, they um, uh, have a different level in which they require a respirator for individuals. So also looking at other factors that can influence the respirator selection, looking at uh, the job site and just how um, the temperature of that job site is, the heat, the humidity, if it's outside, and, and the amount of air circulation there is, the duration of a use of a respirator, um, the underlying health of the worker, if they have any kind of a lung or cardiac issues um, uh, in their personal health, and uh, looking at respi respirator fit. So important, uh, especially for the tight fitting mask, there cannot be any facial hair on the face that would get in the way of the seal for that mask, including any uh, stubble um, in the beard. So knowing that you can see in the picture here on the slide that there is a, a number of different kinds of masks. Um, at the bottom right, you see a full face um, cartridge um, respirator, and um, on the left, you see it more of an N95 mask used a lot in medical uh, settings. Um, but it's important to know the various kinds of respirators and their characteristics and when it's most important to use those. And Matt will go through that in greater detail uh, later in our presentation. It's also, um, OSHA has uh, assigned protection factors for different masks, and those can be looked up as well. And it's important to see that the mask is providing, or the respirator is providing the protection that's needed. The US Department of Labor has a OSHA e-tool called the Advisor Genius that is there to help you select the best respirator. Biological hazard assessment in healthcare and in labs, um, as well as some animal care kind of facilities uh, are important. Um, California is the only state plan that has an ATD, ATD standard, and um, it's um, uh, very important to take a look at that. And if you're, you have uh, workers that are in healthcare or working in labs where they may be exposed to aerosolized pathogens or working with animals and where there's zoonotic or meaning that there's pathogens that can be passed from animals to humans. Uh, all that would be important to take a look at, evaluating jobs in these different areas, and especially um, recognizing when there's aerosol generating procedures. They increase the risk um, considerably. 
not only direct uh, patient or animal care or directly working with the pathogen, also looking at the people that are in the facilities and housekeeping in an organization uh, would um, be important to see who changes the filters in isolation rooms or uh, cleans different work areas where there may be use of, um, of these path pathogens um, or patients that have been in that area. So aerosol transmissible diseases means diseases transmitted when that infectious pathogen can be suspended or present in particles or droplets in the air and sometimes can stay there for quite a while and then be inhaled or go uh, into a mucous membrane and be passed on, transmitted to an uh, individual. Some of those that um, you probably hear of the most and you see the most N95s used for is um, tuberculosis or rule out tuberculosis um, in the hospital um, and people are put into isolation and uh, healthcare providers are uh, use masks and other personal protective equipment when working with them. Other kind of um, ATDs include the H1N1 influenza, measles virus, uh, SARS of the severe acute respiratory syndrome, um, some um, meningitis and some novel or emerging pathogens uh, in the last year or two, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS um, was uh, uh, of concern in our area. Uh, so when looking at all these, you can uh, look at isolation of the individual with the disease um, or the pathogen if it's in a lab, and also to use a filtering face piece respirator when doing patient uh, care. If there is an aerosol generating procedure, such as an endotracheal intubation, uh, tracheostomy care, suctioning, or pulmonary function testing uh, performed on patients, then it's important and you often see most in medical uh, settings uh, the use of the PAPR or a powered air purifying respirator that brings air up through a filter and across in a hooded mask that um, individuals wear. So some resources are listed here at the bottom of the ATD standard, as well as an infection control reference for guideline to isolation precautions, more useful for inpatient settings, and the California Department of Public Health toolkit um, that's helpful for in healthcare workplaces as well. So first and foremost, before uh, implementing the use of respirators, it's important to take a look at the overall overarching sort of goal of a respirator, respiratory protection program is to assess if there's any way to prevent um, the atmospheric contamination with certain chemicals or contaminants and to protect the health of the employees. Um, and so you may take a look at use this hierarchy of controls. Um, first and foremost, to look at if you can eliminate or replace the hazard. Maybe you don't need to use that chemical per se in this process. There's a substitution of a less toxic material. This may not be possible, obviously, for biological hazards, given it's what the patient shows up with um, that's uh, oftentimes the hazard. But in uh, other settings, uh, you can sometimes eliminate or replace the hazard. Uh, second thing is uh, engineering controls, looking at enclosing or confining of a process or an exposure. Obviously, in medical situations, isolation rooms do that. There also can be confinement in terms of boxes or um, uh, hoods um, in different areas that can also um, provide that sort of um, containment. And then you also can look at general and local ventilation. Um, you Sometimes there's HEPA filters used in isolation rooms to decrease the number of um, uh, particles that are in the air. There's also sometimes a special general ventilation where they have UV light in the um, 
ventilation system to destroy viruses so the recirculating air is cleaner, or that you have local ventilation that's directly uh, next to a process where it's pulling uh, dusts and fumes from the breathing space of the employee. Thirdly, looking at administrative controls, looking at the time that somebody is um, exposed to an airborne hazard, um, limiting it and rotating work so that there uh, isn't uh, a, a longer kind of period of time of exposure. And then once all of those kind of controls are looked at, then it's um, and none of those could eliminate the um, uh, exposure level that um, you did not want to have to with the employees, then you look to the personal protective equipment and the respirator for um, supplying a respirator for each uh, employee um, and uh, specific that for that hazard that is seen. Thanks, Beth. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the types of respirators. So a reminder, uh, two things. One, a quick ergonomic reminder, stand up and stretch. Um, the topic can be a little bit dry, so we'll, uh, we want to keep you awake. Uh, get up and move around a little bit. Uh, a respirator is a device worn over the nose and the mouth to protect the wearer's respiratory system from hazardous agents in the breathing zone. Uh, there are generally two classes of respirators, air purifying respirators that use a filter, cartridge, or canister uh, to remove contaminants from the air. A uh, commonly known one is the filtering face piece, such as an N95 mask. We'll clarify exactly what that designation means in just a little bit. Um, I do want to mention a reminder here that this uh, does not include things like surgical face masks or dust masks, which are loose fitting and um, are not considered respirators because they don't uh, provide the wearer with adequate protection uh, from uh, contaminants. And there are reusable respirators, um, the elastomeric respirators such as half face or full face respirators and the powered air purifying respirators or cappers. All of these pull air through that cartridge or filter, and then the wearer breathes that filtered air. Another, the second type of, or class of respirator is the atmosphere supplying respirator, um, in which uh, clean air is provided from an uncontaminated contained source, uh, such as a supplied air respirator, um, where air is pumped through tubing, uh, to the user or a self-contained breathing apparatus where the wearer carries the uh, air supply with them, the atmosphere supply with them. Now those filter ratings uh, that I mentioned, such as N95, that letter designation uh, indicates whether or not the respirator is oil resistant. So N indicates it's not oil resistant which is often not required in uh, settings such as the healthcare setting. Uh, R would be somewhat oil resistant and P indicates that the mask is oil proof, uh, is in fact oil resistant. And the numeric designation indicates how efficient the filter is. So in 95, in, such as an N95, that 95 means it's 95% effective in re removing um, the contaminant. Uh, 99 or 100 indicate that those are better. They can be a little more difficult to pull air through uh, because of that additional filtration. So you want to use the appropriate filter for your needs and uh, there is a downside to being overprotected. Um, it can create more work for the user. I'll do a quick mention about cartridges and canisters uh, for these filters. Uh, they are uh, color-coded um, based on the contaminant that they protect against. Um, commonly seen are that purple, the purple designation for particulates, but the other color codes indicate that uh, are a quick, quick guide to uh, what is being protected against by use of that filter. 
uh, so they're not uh, perfectly interchangeable. You can't just grab any filter and use it and assume you're protected against particulates when you've got a green filter on there for ammonia, ammonia vapor. So it's important to be using the right tool for the job. Now, OSHA does assign protection factors to masks. The APF is the workplace level of uh, respiratory protection that a respirator or a class of respirators uh, is expected to provide 95% uh, of the time. Uh, so an APF of 10 indicates that that particular mask uh, would protect against 10 times the permissible exposure limit in the atmosphere. So if you wear your mask, you can wear it up to um, 10 times the PEL. Uh, if it's more than that, you'd need a different kind of mask that protects against a higher amount. Uh, the employer must use the assigned protection factors listed in the Cal OSHA Respiratory Protection Standard on table one in order to select the respirator that meets or exceeds the, uh, the level required. For protection against that, uh, gases or vapors, use an atmosphere supplying respirator or an air purifying respirator with an end of service life indicator, which I'll mention briefly in a slide or two. For protection against particulates, use an atmosphere supplying respirator or an air purifying respirator with a HEPA filter uh, or a filter that's certified for particulates. And in the case of immediate danger to life or health situations, use a full face pressure demand SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus, or a full face piece pressure demand supplied uh, air respirator. So again, those are ones where you're, you've got clean, uh, pure air being supplied to you. Uh, because those immediate danger to life or health situations might include uh, oxygen deficient atmosphere. So filtering the air is not gonna help in a situation like that. Here are those uh, OSHA's assigned protection factors. So uh, particulate filtering face piece respirator such as N95 has an APF rating of 10, as do the elastomeric half face respirators. Uh, powered air purifying respirators have an APF of 25. So you can use those up into uh, 25 uh, PEL for the particular hazard. Uh, and elastomeric full face respirators have an APF, a protection factor of 50. The SCBAs, uh, not surprisingly, the APF is much, much higher uh, because you're having pure air supplied to you. There's an APF of 10,000. NIOSH certifies uh, respirators. Uh, you should see the NIOSH name or logo on that, on the respirator. The filter will have an alphanumeric rating, which we've discussed, such as P100 or N95, as well as the lot number. Uh, the box they come in will have an expiration date uh, for those respirators as well, or the cartridges, rather. NIOSH has a website with an online tool, a quick search tool that'll help you select the type of respirator, view the quick results, and see uh, which types are actually approved. So you want to do that, make sure you're getting something that meets your needs and will actually work. Respirator maintenance is important. Uh, as part of the training, the annual required training, you do need to train workers on how to maintain their respirators. Those filtering face piece respirators do need to be inspected. Um, you should do that prior to use. Uh, they are single use and then discarded. You don't clean, uh, store, or repair them uh, for later use. Don't write on them. Uh, they're one use and discard. The other respirators are reusable. They should be inspected, cleaned, repaired, and properly stored in a cool, clean, dry environment. Now for problems detected, you don't use the respirator report at the management uh, for uh, authorized repair. Only NIOSH approved replacement parts can be used. The employer is required to document repairs and replacement of parts. Uh, you follow the manufacturer's instructions for cleaning. Uh, there are often recommendations about uh, types of cleaning agents 
uh, avoiding alcohol to so that the uh, the elastomeric portion of the respirator doesn't get dried out and using alternate uh, cleaning agents instead. But those will vary according to the manufacturer. The end of service life indicators are uh, something used for certain types of masks um, and certain types of filters uh, that will have a visual display uh, indicating whether or not the sorbent is approaching saturation or if it's no longer effective. And that means it's expired, it needs to be changed out. That change should occur before the user is smelling the agent, uh, which indicate, would indicate that it's not being uh, appropriate, appropriately filtered, the air is not being appropriately filtered at that point. Um, the filters, filters typically don't have, um, uh, particular filters don't particularly have an end of service life indicator. Uh, in, the, in that case, you would change out when uh, breathing resistance is noted or uh, if your respiratory protection program has a particular change schedule. Uh, so you should have a, an established change schedule um, that may be affected by the frequency of use, uh, storage of the filters, the expiration date on the manufacturer's box, things like that. Uh, and a reminder to never alter the respirator, um, you know, glue, tape, staple um, right on those cartridges, uh, on the filter areas, uh, that sort of thing. So in terms of the next step, once you've uh, determined what respirator would be chosen, you need to look at doing the medical evaluation um, to make sure that wearing a respirator does not pose a health risk to the employee. So this medical evaluation needs to be done before any fit testing or use of the respirator. Uh, some of the things we look for is to make sure it does not cause uh, too much of a physical burden on the individual, or psychological stress, or adverse health effects. So the individual that uh, determines this um, uh, or does the medical evaluation can be a physician or other licensed healthcare professional, and that can mean um, RN, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant. Um, so the uh, First and foremost, the employer needs to provide to the uh, healthcare, um, to the medical provider, the information about the type and weight of the respirator that's going to be used, the duration and frequency of use, uh, what the workplace conditions are, such as extreme heat or uh, how much physical exertion uh, they're going to need to be doing while using this respirator including how heavy the protective clothing or equipment is. Um, all of this to look at in terms of what kind of um, physical um, burden there might be while using the respirator. So first and foremost, um, uh, as the part of the evaluation that is required is that all employees complete the medical questionnaire from standard, uh, from the CalOSHA standard uh, Appendix C, um, and um, or an initial medical examination that obtains the same information as the medical questionnaire. In general, that medical questionnaire is quite lengthy and has quite a few questions. So, uh, in regards to people's symptoms um, or pre-existing diseases, especially of acute chronic conditions with um, uh, lungs and heart. So, any kind of prior chronic disease history or symptoms of poor lung function or psychological conditions such as claustrophobia and difficulty putting something over their face would be issues that we would want to um, evaluate further. If there's any um, um, yes to any of these health questions, then there's a need for a follow-up medical exam by the um, medical provider. And the type of that uh, follow-up medical exam and the, um, what testing uh, needs to be done, such as pulmonary function testing or other testing, um, would be at the discretion of that medical provider. And then once that's been done, there's a written evaluation by the medical provider 
saying um, that either the individual is cleared to wear the respirator um, they are required to use or cleared with certain restrictions. Say um, maybe it's too much for the individual to wear a negative pressure respirator or maybe it's too physical of a process. So there may be an advising of using a papper um, where air is supplied and um, limiting the amount of time um, that they would be using it. And finally, there could be the <clears throat> evaluation that, that it, the person is restricted from respirator use. This is pretty uncommon. I've had just one instance where there was an individual who had very severe claustrophobia due to trauma as a child and could not have anything over her face. So in fact, that was the only time in which there was truly restricted totally from respirator use. So medical reevaluation um, is required if there's any of the following. If the worker uh, has reports any medical signs or symptoms um, related to their ability to use the respirator or has difficulty while wearing the respirator and reports these. If there's any uh, major changes in their face that would alter the respirator fit, such as um, greater than 25 pound weight change, facial surgery or dental changes, and if there's any feedback from any of the other professionals that are involved with the respiratory protection program, such as the employees, a supervisor, the medical provider, or the program administrator, that say they need, they feel there needs to be a reevaluation. Um, also, uh, if while doing fit testing for uh, workers, if there's difficulty in terms of using the mask or the uh, respirator, then um, they can be referred for reevaluation as well. Or if there's any changes in the workplace that result in a new or different kind of respirator being used or a difference in the kind of physiological burden the uh, work processes um, are taking. After the medical evaluation and the employee's been cleared, then you look at resp respirator fit testing. And this is used to test the seal between the respirator um, face piece and the employee's face. You wanna make sure there's a tight seal and uh, to, be, uh, to work efficiently or to work at all, actually. So this um, for, uh, Tight-fitting respirators, they require fit testing. Um, you do it with the uh, respirator that the individual is using on the job. And you can provide a selection of models of respirators that can be used in a situation to foster compliance. Because, um, for example, with the N95 masks, there are some that fit fuller-cheeked individuals and then there are others where there's a, a flatter face, the um, duckbill N95 fits better. So uh, different kinds of uh, respirators have uh, different characteristics that will fit different types of faces. If there's more than one respirator that an individual is using, then you need to fit test for each and, um, and need to go over how to use other uh, personal protective equipment, such as safety glasses, um, it, so that they do not interfere with the respirator seal. Um, and again, as we mentioned before, there can be no facial hair at all um, uh, to use a tight-fitting respirator. While doing the fit testing, often very important to go over um, some demonstration and training uh, with the individual, looking um, at how they inspect the respirator, how they don or put it on, how they check for a seal check. Uh, you'll see um, the paper, um, oftentimes there might be that you check if there's any air leaks around uh, N95 or you check uh, to the right here in the picture, they're checking where you breathe in and you feel that um, uh, uh, on your hands. Um, and then doffing or taking off the respirator. 
So this should this whole process and these steps should be completed every time individual uses a respirator, and this can be a, a good time at fit testing to review that. And review as well, if you cannot achieve a proper seal, then you would not use the respirator and not enter the hazardous area. Loose fitting respirators, such as like a PAPR, um, do not require the fit testing. So there are two types of fit testing, qualitative fit testing and quantitative. I'm going to talk a little bit about the qualitative and Matt will pick up on the quantitative. Um, qualitative fit testing is um, where you have an irritant that the person can taste or smell or can be irritated by, and there's approved agents that can be used, that you spray inside a hood with the employee using the mask um, or the um, respirator and making sure that they cannot uh, detect that uh, irritant um, ensures that there's a properly sealed respirator face piece. Um, this is only allowed for tight-fitting negative pressure air purifying respirators that must meet a fact fit factor of 100 or less. If there is a respirator that's to be used in the workplace where the level of hazardous contaminant is more than 10 times the PEL, then the quantitative fit testing needs to be performed. Yes. So quantitative fit testing uses a machine such as a port account to measure the air leakage uh, into the respirator face piece. Uh, so again, this gives a, a, a the outputs a numeric reading that uh, tells you what the fit factor is for uh, that particular respirator on that user. It does not rely on the worker's sense of smell or taste. Uh, it runs the user through a series of movements, uh, normal breathing, deep breathing, move your head up and down, bend over, turn, from, turn your head from side to side, um, all those sorts of things, the same kinds of things that are done with the qualitative fit testing to check for leakage. Uh, and a score is emitted at the end. Um, or the user fails and um, a different mask needs to be tried or it needs to be checked for um, uh, proper fit. So there are issues that come up during fit testing periodically. Uh, I recommend that you start with the simple stuff. Um, so in the case of those uh, filtering face piece masks, make sure the mask is actually on correctly. Uh, all too often, they're put on upside down. So in that case, turn it right side up. Uh, check the areas which are most common for air leakage, which is around the bridge of the nose and under the chin. Um, on those filtering face piece masks, uh, there's often a, uh, a metallic mold uh, that you can uh, improve fit by molding that over the nose. Uh, and the other masks, check the mask. Uh, in the case of, of the quantitative fit testing, you may also need to check the hoses, the adapters uh, for any leaks uh, or cracks that may actually be in the, uh, on the testing device itself and not with the mask uh, to look and see if there's leakage there. Remember that no single mask uh, type is a universal fit. So Bev mentioned uh, the difference, different shapes in some of the N95 masks, the standard round mask versus a duck bill. Uh, this is true for half face and full face. You may need to try a different model uh, with a worker because no one mask is going to fit everyone. And for quantitative fit tests, uh, there are issues that can come up. You want to check that measurement tube to make sure it's actually in the breathing space, uh, that it's the correct length there. And uh, you may need to put the clip in the suction uh, cup on the end uh, so it doesn't get obstructed against the user's face or up against the wall of the mask uh, because it needs to be unobstructed in order to make those measurements. Uh, so that's a that's a common area. If you don't use that clip on the end, it can get blocked off and give you uh, wildly inaccurate readings. So looking at worker training, it's very important and crucial part of the um, respiratory protection program. 
um, is to be provided for any employee required to wear a respirator. And this is an annual training, no cost to the employee during work hours, and must be understandable to the employee. Um, this includes a review of uh, respiratory hazards that are in the workplace, routine and emergency use of respirators, um, review of the federal and state OSHA requirements, as well as the company's written respiratory protection program and where that can be found for um, future uh, uh, review. Uh, also, this is a time where, again, the worker can demonstrate their knowledge about the respirator and how to use it, understanding the medical signs and symptoms that can limit or prevent use, and, um, and understand that if there's any changes um, in their work processes, work hazards, that there um, may need to be additional training and, um, or if there's any change in the respirator in which they're using. Um, if, in fact, doing a walkthrough uh, proper respirator use is not demonstrated by an uh, individual, then they may be brought back for additional training as well. There's some resources below um, where there are some good uh, sort of uh, videos for training that could be used and some training kits that might be helpful um, to use in your organization. So the written respiratory protection program is more um, is a key of the standard. It's to cover all the elements we've talked about previous to this and update as needed if there's change in hazards or respirators. There is a template for a written program in OSHA Hospital Respiratory Protection Program Toolkit, um, which uh, has um, you can just fill in your information, so that is helpful. You can take a look at that and see if that's some, something useful if you need to write a written program. In addition, um, the program of evaluation is required. Um, this can be accomplished just by developing some checklists and evaluation forms um, to track and measure program elements. Um, you can do some walkthrough surveys, interview workers and supervisors on uh, how well the, they feel the program is working. You can do spot checks for seal checks for employees or anonymous worker surveys um, and tracking compliance with the uh, kind of fit testing and training that needs to be done um, and the annual review of, of what kind of respirators are needed and then tracking if there's any reported work-related respiratory illnesses or injuries. Okay, and there are situations where um, questions about voluntary use of respirators may arise. Um, an employee wants to use a respirator uh, for one reason or another. Uh, keep in mind that this is only permitted when the employer has determined that there's a, not an actual respiratory hazard and respirator use is not required. Uh, also note that when respirators are used voluntarily, the employer needs to ensure that that use doesn't in and of itself create any hazard for that worker or for anybody else. Um, and you've got to give the employee or the employees that are using a respirator on a voluntary basis a copy of Appendix D of the Respiratory Protection Standard or equivalent information. So that's actually, there's not surprisingly, some paperwork involved. Uh, you've got to you've got to give them some information. Uh, now, whether to give out masks or not uh, is certainly an employer decision. Uh, it's not a requirement uh, for voluntary use. Uh, sensitivities to smoke or other irritants vary by person to person. Might be related to underlying medical conditions or sensitivities. Uh, the worker could have a legitimate reason for the request. Uh, uh, but as a general policy, that's up to the employer on whether or not they want to give out uh, give out masks for uh, voluntary use. There's a great set of frequently asked questions. So since we don't have a ton of time here, um, at the California Department of Industrial Relations, with the link provided here, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. It's actually um, pretty useful. Uh, Non-workplace respiratory hazards such as wild, wildfires um, can
in a workplace, sorry about that, can create a workplace respiratory hazard. So if a worker is required to do work um, in an area with a hazard, even if it's not created in the workplace, so there's wildfire smoke, but you're requiring your worker to work outside, a respirator may be required depending on the exposure. Uh, if that's the case, this warrants training, medical clearance, and fit testing. In the event of a smoky atmosphere uh, for general public or your general employee population wanting to use a respirator, uh, an advisement should be made to use the preferred initial steps, uh, which don't require respirator use, staying indoors, modifying activity using air conditioners or local air filters. If a mask is warranted, uh, a reminder to people not to use surgical masks or dust masks or bandanas because these don't actually provide protection against those particulates of concern. Um, there's some great guidance um, from the California Department of Public Health on the, at the bottom of this slide, the first link, um, that's that one page flyer and a, some detailed public health guidance regarding wildfire smoke. This is a 50-ish page document, um, but in a lot of detail about wildfires concerns um, uh, on that second link. So I'd encourage you to take some time to look at that if, uh, if that's relevant to you. So a quick summary since we're wrapping up here. Uh, the Cal OSHA Respiratory Protection Standard does have clear requirements, including a written program with a trained administrator that addresses all eight program elements. Uh, at the end of this program, there are some reference slides that include uh, easy access to specific details uh, and links or uh, information to get you to the things that we discussed today. We encourage you to become involved with your local occupational health organizations in order to network with other professionals and share best practices. I think we can open things up to questions at this stage. Wonderful, thank you guys so much. Um, we do have some questions in our Q&A here. Uh, the first question, since respiratory care practitioners are licensed in California, are they allowed to perform the medical evaluation? Respiratory care practitioners? Uh, yes. So a respiratory therapist, I assume. Um, if the person who asked that question wants to elaborate, you're welcome to. Um, I just have since respiratory care practitioners. I do think it oh, needs yes, to be. I'm not a hundred. I'm not a hundred percent certain on this, um, but I believe it needs to be um, a medical provider. Uh, so a physician, uh, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant. And sometimes but RNs, I, uh, occupational health nurses, but I have uh, not seen respiratory therapists um, in that role before. Nor have I. So I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but I don't believe so. So I'm 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 a little confused by respiratory care practitioners that title if that in in fact talking about a respiratory therapist. Uh, um, yes, it is. Okay, yeah, I have not seen respiratory therapists um, be involved with that kind of um, uh, medical clearance. Um, uh, previously, but that doesn't mean, um, I, I've just seen it when it's clarified what can be um, other licensed uh, care uh, practitioners. It was more along the lines of uh, what Matt said in terms of RN, uh, NP, and PA. I haven't seen any other kind of um, professionals be involved with that. Great, thank you. 
Um, another question, in emergency and semi-emergency situations, for example, California wildfires that are producing unhealthy air quality, um, N95 masks are used for workers who are required to go outside, but it may be impossible for large organizations, for example, the University of California, CSU campuses, county and city government workers, et cetera, to have everyone fit tested. And they were wondering if you had any comments or thoughts on that. Beth, do you want to jump in on that one? <laughs> well, I think that it, that it does pose a, a problem because um, obviously if people are using it for personal sort of uh, use, it's not something where they have to be outside to do work. Um, that would be a way in which to hone down the numbers of people that would need to um, be required to be doing work in that area and um, need to have a mask. Um, it does make it hard when we've had the recent wildfires and days upon end of smoke in the atmosphere. I can understand how that would be difficult. Um, but I would say that would be a way in which you could have majority of people that could uh, have limited amount of time outside um, you know, use the air conditioning and air filters and uh, other kinds of um, mechanisms for protecting themselves and only the people that need to be out for, uh, you know, outside for most of their time that they're working, um, be involved with and getting fit tested and trained and, and utilize a respirator during that time. Yeah, I'd agree with Bev. This somewhat falls under the hierarchy of controls uh, philosophy that uh, your number one goal is to minimize minimize exposure. So if you can move the work to a few weeks later when the wildfire smoke is more likely to have dissipated, uh, the hazard's not there any longer, um, you can keep people out of that. Uh, Again, if you're requiring people to work and there is a respirator hazard that warrants use of a respirator, then it's no longer voluntary. Uh, and you've got to have your respiratory protection program in place in that case, um, be it for routine use or for emergency use. Uh, for truly voluntary work, you can, uh, or for truly voluntary use, uh, again, I'd encourage you to take a look at that one-page flyer uh, that you can give your employees um, or your your workplace population, uh, refer them to. But if you need to establish a program, you might want to go to that more detailed uh, wildfire public health policy that I mentioned. Um, and there's a link to uh, in that next to last slide. Great. We have a few more questions. Um, someone had asked, can sharing of respirators amongst users be done safely? No. Uh, sharing, well, for Maybe. the dis disposables, no. No, but for not, reusables, not for N95s. That's correct. Yeah. You're talking so that, about... The answer to that um, one is no. But you're talking about a half mask and that sort of thing? Um, the, the question just asked in general. Yeah. So for half face masks, that sort of thing, ideally people have, have a particular respirator uh, that they use, but that's not necessarily required. You can, quote unquote, share a mask. You would clean it between use. You wouldn't, uh, uh, ideally would not be sharing the cartridges uh, so that you could track uh, how much use uh, the individual cartridges were getting, um, but you could actually you could actually share a respirator, the the physical respirator. It's not ideal, but it is possible. Yes. Okay. Um, and then also, what type of OSHA citations are issued for respirators? I'm not sure I entirely I, under, understand the question. NIOSH will certify respirators. Um, you're saying if OSHA comes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, to I, me, I, 
I interpret that question more as um, if OSHA came and there was a respirator violation, what kind of citation you might receive? I'm not, uh, I'm not savvy in terms of, of what I would think it would be if there wasn't some of those elements in the program, in your program, um, as well as, um, you know, that there wasn't a, uh, a administrator, there wasn't a written program, all of those things could be noted. Um, but um, uh, any part of that, but in terms of what the amount of the citation is or what the specific language of the citation, I, I, I haven't been involved with any of those, so I, I wouldn't be aware of that. Great. There I'd is the OSHA yeah, consultation service that you can call and um, they can uh, probably address that more uh, with more detail. Great. I, I'd expect if OSHA came out for a simple policy infraction that they would write a, a repair order. You've got to update this in a certain time frame, uh, make sure the elements are in place and there might may or may not be a, a small fine associated to that associated with that. But if it was in response to an incident uh, where a worker were injured um, uh, or something more significant, then there would be penalties in place, but it would vary widely depending on um, on what the issue was, if the issue arose because of uh, policy flaws, if people were actually hurt, if there were some issue where the general public were exposed to a hazard because of flaws in the program, those would be greater fines. Great. Well, thank you guys both so much. Um, we're, we're now hitting 1130. I do have one more question if you guys have a, a couple more minutes. Sure. Sure. Okay, awesome. Um, the last question is, is it expensive to use a quantitative fit testing program? Yes. I'll let Matt, <laughs> Matt take that. <laughs> uh, mostly because the, the quantitative testing itself isn't dramatically different from qualitative testing. It takes 10 minutes-ish to do the test. Um, so it takes about the same amount of time, but the machine, it's the machines themselves do tend to be expensive, uh, five figures, about $10,000. Uh, so they are, it is a pricey initial investment to get that done and it requires uh, annual servicing uh, to make sure it's, it's up to spec uh, and some routine upkeep, uh, which is minimal and pretty easy. But the initial investment is is expensive, not for a large organization, but uh, but for for smaller groups, it's a pricey uh, shell out on the first on that first step. It lasts a long time, though. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everyone who also joined us online for today's webinar. I'd also like to thank today's webinar co-sponsor, the California El Camino Real Association of Occupational Health Nurses. Um, COEH has our monthly webinar series, which takes place on the first Wednesday of each month at 1030 a.m. Next month on Wednesday, October 3rd, we're honored to welcome Richard Meyer, who will present on the Process Safety Implementation Pyramid, a tool for understanding the fundamentals of chemical process safety. Details about our webinars and other upcoming events can be found on our website, coeh.berkeley.edu. Thank you all so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.